Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains hovering. Yep, just that. And today, we are going to discuss, well, another five worst of lists, as people like it when I talk about horrible things. But I decided to switch it up yet again and do something a little bit new. We're still on aircraft, but now we're going to focus on helicopters. I love helicopters. I've always thought they are so cool, but there have been plenty of times when helicopters have been manufactured and the end result is something that really just shouldn't have been produced at all. These are five of the worst helicopters ever. The Bristol Type 192 Belvedere. The Belvedere was an interesting development in helicopter technology. As you can see, it's a twin rotor helicopter. One rotor spins at the front and one spins at the back, and they spin in different directions to keep the aircraft stable. It first flew on the 5th of July, 1958, and they were originally designed for anti-submarine warfare. This is very, very, very relevant because they weren't accepted into that role. The Bristol Aeroplane Company didn't want to give up on them, so they pitched them as a troop transport instead. Now, in the defense of the Belvedere, they were very fast, they had decent cargo space for multiple people, so it wasn't like they were incapable of doing this. The little small aspects of their design should have been tweaked to encompass this new role. Bristol just didn't do that. They basically made no changes between the two models, and this made the Belvedere not really a very good troop transport in any way. For example, you've probably seen tandem rotor helicopters function as troop transports like the Chinook. It has a rear ramp. This makes it very easy for people to get on and off the helicopter. Even smaller helicopters like the Yui have a door that's pretty much one step up from the ground. The Belvedere's door was, at its lowest, four feet off the ground. This makes it so that quick extraction of troops, or even quick insertions of troops, is just not nearly as quick as it would be with pretty much any other helicopter that was actually designed for this sole purpose. Their engines were also located at either end of the helicopter, a setup that caused some vibrational issues, so that was never resolved. And the other issue is that the engines were started by using a substance that they called Avpin. Now, Avpin is basically another name for isopropyl nitrate. It's an incredibly, incredibly flammable substance that burns with a flame that's almost invisible. It's very relevant because it doesn't actually require oxygen to burn. Now, militaries all over the world actually had success using it to quick start jet engines. It was actually crucial that this was involved for fast scrambling purposes. But when it was applied to this helicopter, it resulted in some mismanagement of the material, resulting in fires, which is bad. And because the forward engine was placed immediately behind the cockpit, it meant that in order for the crew of the helicopter to actually bail, they'd have to rush through a horrific chemical fire, and that's just not good for anybody. They were introduced to the Royal Air Force in 1961, but they only ever took 26 of them, and retired them by 1969. The Robinson R-22. This is not a military helicopter, as you undoubtedly noticed. This is a two-seat, two-bladed, single-engine light utility helicopter that was introduced and still is manufactured by the Robinson Helicopter Company. Yes, these helicopters are still being produced as of now. Now, for an experienced helicopter pilot, the R-22 probably isn't that dangerous or even really that bad. They were designed to be as light and cheap as possible, and they are. These days, however, they're often being utilized as training helicopters for new pilots, and that would be fine, except that these things are insanely difficult to keep stable. The two major issues that have been pointed out with these things is that, for one, the main rotor on these things is lightweight in itself, because of course it is, but this means it produces very little inertia. If the engine stops in midair, there's not very much time to lower the collective and allow the rotors to enter auto rotation. This exact thing has resulted in multiple crashes and deaths, so that's good. But there's also an issue of mast bumping. 
As blades on helicopters rotate, they tend to flap up and down. The R-22 only has two blades, so in its case, if one blade goes down, the other is going to go up like a seesaw. That, again, is also fine and is totally normal for a helicopter like this. But, in extreme cases, the root of the downward going blade can actually strike the shaft. This can cause the blade to remove the tail boom, the cockpit roof, or just causing the whole rotor head to fly off the aircraft, whatever. Either way, all those situations are known as catastrophic failures when it comes to helicopters. Because the R-22 is so light, any form of turbulence can make the seesaw movement of its blades a lot worse. And in order to fly one of these solo, the FAA actually requires a separate logbook signature to state that special training has been completed to deal with this unique issue with the R-22. That being said, when they're handled by a pilot that knows about these issues in dealing with a lightweight helicopter, they're totally fine, but the problem we have now is that they're being used for trainers, and therefore being used by pilots who literally aren't experienced. In their defense, though, Robinson has taken steps to improve the R-22 since their initial introduction. The rates of the accidents actually fell from 6.0 per 100,000 flights to just 0.7. So it's clear the R-22 has gotten improvements, but I still personally would be a little hesitant to fly the thing myself. Just throwing it out there. The Yakovlev Yak-24. The NATO reporting name of this aircraft is Horse. Yes? Horse. And I think that's absolutely hysterical, and I'm going to be calling it that this entire time. As you can see, this is another contra-rotating helicopter, with one rotor in the back and one in the front. They rotate different directions to keep the aircraft stable. And that's all totally fine. They first flew on the 3rd of July, 1952, and were constructed initially as a result of a meeting between Joseph Stalin himself and senior aircraft designers of the Soviet Union. Now, in the defense of the horse, it totally flew, but it had multiple problems. For one thing, the engines it used, the Schutzhoff ASH-82V radial engines, had never been put in this particular tandem setup before. And in fact, this tandem setup was not typical for Soviet helicopters in general. The Russians that worked with it actually took to calling it the Letayushki Wagon, which translated in English to the Flying Railroad Car, which, yeah, I guess I can kind of see that. Between 40 and 100 of these things wound up being built, and I know that's really vague because sources aren't clear exactly when they stopped production and how many they wound up making in the end. We know it was at least 40, though, and we also know that they had a very major fault with their engine layout. Similarly to the Belvedere, they put one engine in the front and one in the back. Now, that's all well and good, but the one in the back was literally above the loading ramp, and the one in the front was tilted over and squeezed behind the cockpit. There wasn't a lot of room in there from the get-go. In an interesting design element, in the event of an engine failure, it was decided to link the engines via a synchronization shaft that connected their two gearboxes. If one of the engines failed, this meant the helicopter could still turn both rotors using only one. Now, on paper, that's actually a great idea. But with everything being linked together with the shaft, and the torque combined of the large rotors, it meant that the helicopter suffered severe vibration issues. The first one actually ripped itself to pieces in a ground test when its rear rotor came off with the gearbox and pulled the entire fuselage apart. The Yak-24 never stopped doing this, but they did manage to limit the severity to the point that it actually could fly. They removed half a meter from the end of each rotor. But the vibration issue never stopped. It was always horrific. Several accidents actually plagued its career, and most of them weren't due to enemy fire. The Percival P.74, later known as Hunting Percival P.74, it was a British experimental helicopter that was designed in the 1950s by the Percival Aircraft Company. It based itself on the use of tipjet powered rotors. The tipjet idea for rotors basically puts a jet nozzle at the tip of helicopter rotor blades. This changes the physics quite a bit. For example, there would be no torque issue from a direct drive engine, so helicopters with this setup actually don't need tail rotors at all or even contra-rotating rotors. It's an interesting idea, but it's historically been very hard to implement effectively, or economically, or in this case, at all. The P.74, on paper, probably should have been fine. 
little bulgy, a little clunky looking, but it was experimental, and I kind of like it. It looks kind of cute, except for the other little itsy bitsy problem, and the major one was that the P.74 never flew at any point. Then they tried really hard to get this thing off the ground, and it just refused to leave the Earth. The test pilots were under the impression that it was simply underpowered. And in some ways they were actually thankful it didn't take off because the cockpit was actually designed really poorly. The only entrance door was located at the rear on the port side, and there were no escape provisions for the two pilots. So had it gone in the air and something went wrong, it could have ended very tragically. Fortunately, the P.74 just decided not to fly at all. It just didn't feel like it that day. Or ever again. The entire program was cancelled in 1956, and the only one that was ever built wound up being scrapped. The Delagnir HZ-1 Aerocycle. Do I actually need to clarify what's wrong going on here? Do I need to explain in how many ways this was not a good idea? The Aerocycle was also known as the YHO-2, and by the manufacturer's designation DH-5 Aerocycle. It was an American-built, one-man, personal helicopter that first flew on the 22nd of November, 1954. The U.S. Army was interested in increasing the possibility of advanced mobility on the new atomic battlefield, and thought that giving their troops personal helicopters to fly across such a battlefield might be a great idea. Now, obviously, the control scheme for this thing did not work like a traditional helicopter. It actually used two blades rotating in opposite directions to cancel out the torque. The pilot would actually steer the thing by tilting, and kept stable through the actions of his natural reflexes. Just like riding a bicycle! Except for the fact that if I fall off my bicycle, I'm not gonna be turned into ground beef. Through testing of the 12 prototypes, yes, 12 of them were produced, it was found that even though the concept advertised the notion of simple control and it could be used by pretty much anybody, the truth was that the aerocycles were only stable when under the control of an experienced pilot, someone who had gotten used to how they operated. It didn't help, but they were incredibly unstable in the wind, and there were a total of two accidents during testing, though neither, thank God, resulted in a fatality. Both resulted from the contra-rotating rotors actually hitting each other. And while the idea of a personal levitating craft might be a novel one, I'm just sitting here wondering what the heck they were thinking. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to see the issue here. But this is being used on the new atomic battlefield. It kind of shows off where our troops are at any given moment with the giant whirling blades and them standing, obviously, out in the open. Like, there's no way to duck and cover on this thing! In fact, there's no way to duck at all! Because you would have to land it very carefully and wait for the rotors to stop, unless you would enjoy being delimbed, and I don't know why you would. And after the prototypes proved hilariously unstable, the army brass kinda started noticing the actual issue. Long story short, they were insanely dangerous, and arguably useless, and the whole project was cancelled. You know what's fun, though? One of these things survived into preservation. Yes, really. There is still a single example of the Aerocycle sitting in the U.S. Army Transportation Museum at Fort Eustis, Newport News, Virginia. So you can happily go see one of the most hilariously lethal things that our military budget ever produced. And by lethal, I don't mean good for war. I mean lethal to our own troops! And I don't know why it took actually seeing it in action for you to figure that out, but apparently it did. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust the Third, Some Dude 267, Brightline Blue, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Haas 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time, this is Dark Vision, and I'm out. Josh Johnson and Lock Kraken. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.